Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you today? Fine, thank you. And how are you? Fine. Have you submitted your assignments? Yes, we have. Yes, madam. Okay. Yeah, we yes, madam. Can I see those who haven't submitted? Because uh, about 100 and something people haven't submitted. I'm trying to locate who is uh This is my first class, so I'm hearing first time uh, about the assignment. Mm. You registered late? Yeah, la last week. Okay, anyone else? Is there anyone else who has just joined? So what I would advise you who've just joined is um, try to follow the information on Clanet and perhaps also try to get in touch with your colleagues who've been with me from the first day that we had class. Otherwise, it's very difficult for me to share information as some of you are requesting me to say I should help you with notes and so on. It's very difficult for me to do that because your class is quite big, you're over 300, and it's not possible that I can manage to be attending to you individually. So please try to get in touch with uh, your colleagues and find out how much they've covered. Try to find out the links that have been, have been posting for the lectures that we've been having and any other materials. And um, some other information that you might require is actually there on Clanet, on the board for common and politics. That is where the assignment is also actually so that that's my best advice otherwise it's not possible that i can go back and start teaching from the beginning and i understand that uh, we do have quite a number of economic challenges that's why most of you actually have registered late but it is only hope that in the remaining two months before your exams you'll be able to catch up and also take note that um, is it second week of October or so, I think 5th October somewhere there, uh, DL students are supposed to be sitting for tests. Full-time students will be on, on uh, mid-semester break. By the time you come back, that will be second week of October, full-time students you should also expect to sit for your mid-semester test. So that is according to our academic calendar. And uh, we expect to wind up the semester mid-November so we do not have much time actually so that's the announcement that i wanted to make i don't know if there are any questions before i proceed uh, with looking at today's topic human rights are there any questions or clarifications that you need me to make any questions maybe arising from what i've just explained Okay, if there are no questions, then I want us to proceed to looking at human rights. So when we talk about human rights, it's not a concept that is uh, completely strange to you. This is not something that you can say that you have never heard of. This is something that we talk about each and every time these are things that we experience actually on a daily basis but the only challenge which might be there in issues of human rights is that we, we might lack the technicalities that are linked to human rights we might also lack the knowledge to say each one of us is entitled to these rights what do they do for us and so on so Basically, this chapter is just going to give you an overview of human rights. And it is hoped that at the end of this topic, we'll be able to appreciate what human rights are and why they're important to each and every one of us. So human rights are actually entitlements for everyone who is born human. 
So these are entitlements of everyone who is born human. As long as you are a human being, then just know that you have human rights. Animals also have their own rights and we classify them as animal rights. That's why you see that on some certain roads, it will be indicated animal crossing. That is simply because animals also have rights. You discover that sometimes it may be prohibited to, to just um, kill animals anyhow. It is because they've also got rights and so on. Now we are dealing with a class of rights pertaining to human beings, that is you and I. So now, if you ask the question to say, why are human rights important? Human rights are important because these are rights that we need for survival. We need these rights as human beings to lead a minimally good life. So it simply means that if we do not have these rights, we cannot expect to enjoy life the way that we are enjoying it, at least to appreciate it. Why do I say so? Let me just give you some examples. Uh, when you are born, um, the Lord tries as much as possible to protect the life of an unborn child. Because if you and I were not given an opportunity to be born alive, we would not have been alive today. So, life is actually protected, like in the Zambian context, life is protected at conception. Of course, there are different theories where some people will say life begins at birth, life begins at conception. But in Zambia, life begins at conception because it is important that each and every life is preserved because we don't know who is yet to be born. Maybe that is the person who can and redeem this country. So to begin with, that is a right, which is the right to life. Now, when a child is born, a child has a number of requirements that they need. When they are born, they will need food, which in this instance, uh, perhaps will be milk. They will need clothing. The child will need a number of things, good health care, even at the time of delivery you need good health services even before a woman delivers. So all these things are protected under human rights, under different types of human rights. The first one I've talked about, the right to life. The child needing food to grow, that is the right to food. The child needing to be in, in a conducive environment, that is the right to shelter. The child cannot survive without water, for example. The child needs to bath. That is the right to water. As the child begins to grow, uh, when they reach perhaps three years, four years, you say, okay, let us take this child to kindergarten. That is known as the right to education. As the child grows even more, the child now reaches the age of maturity, the child is entitled to vote. That is the right to vote. At a later stage, the child says, now I want to get married or I want to marry. That is also another right to found a family. So in short, what we are saying is that what supports each and every part of our lives as human beings is what is collectively known as human rights. Because there's no aspect of life that is not provided for under human rights. Now, the law comes in as a suitable mechanism to promote, we say to promote and protect human rights. Why is the law a suitable mechanism? I think by now you understand the nature of law. And apart from that, human rights are not only spoken of by word of mouth, neither are they just found in, in, in governmental policies, but human rights are enshrined in the constitution. And human rights cannot be tempered with by anyone unless you, the citizens of Zambia, decide to change these human rights which are contained under what is known as the Bill of Rights. I think um, most of us who voted in the previous elections saw that as we were trying to vote for the president, there was also a provision to try and uh, amend the Bill of Rights through that referendum, which unfortunately did not go through. So you can see how much respect is attached to humanity. 
As a result, no politician, no president, no one can tamper with our human rights. Why? Because that is the basis of our livelihood. It is human rights that promote us to become better individuals, to develop in life. They also protect us in various ways that sometimes we don't even realize to say these are human rights at work. So a country that respects human rights is a country which can be referred to as a democratic country. For example, um, if the Zambian government is trying as much as possible to promote um, peace and security within the country, it simply means that they're trying to promote our human rights, which is the right to life. Because a person who lives in fear cannot develop into a responsible human being. As you will see in other war-torn countries, our neighboring countries may not be able to contribute effectively to the development of their economy simply because there's a threat of peace and security in, 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 in that particular country. And the government, for example, when it tries to bring up about initiatives to say uh, to open up more, more health posts in rural areas to electrify uh, a number of rural areas to try and promote agriculture. All those are efforts which are done to foster human rights. And you need to note that the government through its millennium development goals, which are so many, some of you I think should be doing development studies, you'll be able to look at these things that all these are done in an effort to protect human rights because human rights basically uh, entail the welfare of a human being. So with that background, I hope I have emphasized the importance of human rights. Are there any questions before we go to the characteristics of human rights? Any questions? Are there any questions? If there are no questions, we proceed to characteristics of human rights. So when we talk about the characteristics of human rights, I picked on five. There could be several characteristics apart from these five. So the first one is that human rights are inviolable. And what this means is that no one is supposed to take away your human rights. That is what we mean when we say invaluable. The other word that we can use is inalienable. No one should temper with your human rights unless maybe where there's a, an express provision in the law, uh, maybe to suspend those rights due to one reason or the other. The next one is that human rights are universal. Now, the universality of human rights is rebatable simply because human rights somehow can be affected by a number of factors such as religion. Human rights can also be affected by social factors. So they may tend to differ slightly. I can give an example of Sharia law. Sharia law is an Islamic concept where a person who commits adultery, I think that's a woman, many can be stoned to death, for example. But uh, other people will come in to say that is inhuman and so on. And I think there was a case actually where an Islamic woman was to be stoned to death and the United Nations actually came in. So in short, what I'm trying to drive at is that as much as we are saying they're universal, but there could be slight differences. For example, um, in Zambia, we might not entertain the right to homosexuality as a right, but in other jurisdictions, it is a right to say a person should be free to either get married to the opposite sex or the same sex. But all these are rights, but there could be disparities due to historical backgrounds, social backgrounds, or religious background. And this aspect of human rights is known as uh, relativism. Relativism meaning they may vary, they may slightly differ depending on some issues that can be looked at such as religion and so on. And the third one is that human rights are inherent. We say that they're inherent because when you are born, you are born with them. 
So a human right is not something that you acquire later on, but you are born with them automatically as a human being. And they are also indivisible. Indivisible means that all rights, as long as you are entitled to them as of age, because some of the human rights are progressive. What I mean by progressive is that when a person is five years old, they cannot vote. But by the time they attain the age of 18, they will be able to acquire a voter's card and vote. But what happens is that once they attain that age of majority, you cannot substitute one right for the other to say, since you are enjoying this right, then you will not enjoy the other right. So they are indivisible. You cannot begin dividing amongst them and saying, since you are enjoying one, then you are not supposed to enjoy the other. So all of them must be enjoyed at the same time as long as you are eligible in short to enjoy them and the last one that i have here is human rights are interdependent it is a strong a string that runs uh, through human rights for me to enjoy the right to life i can't live without water i can't live without food i can't live without shelter so they all depend on each other so all of them put together are what uh, contribute to the full potential of an individual. So these are just characteristics of human rights. Any questions on characteristics? Are there any questions on characteristics? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, let me just briefly talk about the history of human rights. So, towards the end of this chapter, you are going to see something about the international uh, human rights system, or we might say the International Bill of Rights. So, those of you who did European history in secondary schools, um, if we pick it up from the First World War, um, there was a, somewhere in 1919, the League of Nations was formed to try and promote international peace and security, of which the League of Nations failed in its mandate because in 1939, about, we had the outbreak of the Second World War. So we have the successor to the League of Nations, which is uh, the United Nations, which mainly came in with uh, a human rights approach. So the major distinction between the League of Nations and the United Nations is that the United Nations came in to promote international peace and security, but at the apex of its objectives, promotion of human rights. The United Nations aimed to protect humanity because the League had a number of weaknesses um, after the withdrawal of a number of uh, powers around the world, the Second World War broke out. So when the United Nations um, took over from the League of Nations, it established three main documents which we refer to as the International Bill of Rights. A Bill of Rights is simply a list of fundamental rights and freedoms. So human rights, if you go further to, into the subject, you discover that we'll call them some of them rights, some will be freedoms, some will be privileges, but those are now technicalities of human rights as a subject. So the United Nations, first of all, established the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, UDHR, which is actually there. At the end of the chapter, you'll see the notes. This was the first document that uh, the United Nations came up with to try and protect human rights. Secondly, it issued two covenants, the International Covenant on Civil and Political 
rights. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is the ICCPR. Let me just go to these documents so that you're able to see them. So there's a brief background there. So um, these are the documents here. I've talked about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is here. And we have the two covenants, which is the covenant, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Now, this covenant, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, deals with human rights known as um, civil and political rights. Now, this other covenant here, so examples of civil and political rights are the right to vote, right to life, freedom of association, freedom of assembly. And the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, this one has economic rights, such as the right to work, right to health, right to water, right to food. Those are known as economic rights. So this International Bill of Rights is the comprehensive document from which all other member states of the United Nations have emulated in terms of uh, their human rights arrangement, including Zambia. So these are just uh, the core conventions that the United Nations has developed in trying to protect human rights. So there are so many, there are so many conventions, so many human rights instruments, but these are the, the core nine treaties. So any question on the historical background? I'm still explaining a number of issues under uh, human rights. Any questions so far? Are there any questions so far? Any questions so far? I don't know. All right. You have put it very clearly in my hand. Thank you so much. Now, I want to talk about classification of human rights. So now, under classification, let me just do this. I've talked about the International Bill of Rights, where I said UDHR. I talked about the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And then I talked about the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And I said here we have ICCPR has civil and political rights. ICSCR has economic rights. Now I'm trying to, classif to classify human rights. So under the classification of human rights, we have three classes. The first one is first generation. The second one is second generation. The third one is third generation of human rights. And there are even discussions to say there's a fourth class, but that is not uh, pretty settled. Under first generation of human rights, we find civil and political rights, e.g., right, e.g., we have the right to vote, the right to life. These are civil and political rights. Second generation, we have economic rights. Economic rights, we have right to food, 
right to water, right to health. Third generation rights are group rights. Which groups? Vulnerable groups of society. For example, rights of women. A vulnerable group of society is simply a group um, perhaps which receives less uh, favorable treatment as, as compared to other groups such as women, children, disabled, and also LGBT rights. So these are the classes of human rights. First generation, second generation, and third generation. I hope this is clear. So this is the classification of human rights. So you will see how these human rights are protected in Zambia. And that is the part that I really want you to understand and also understand what the referendum was all about. So that next time when we have the referendum, I'm sure you should, we will be able to participate with understanding. So that is the, the classification of human rights. Now I want us to look at human rights under the Zambian constitution. So now we're going to look at the Zambian Bill of Rights, of which I've, I've already explained what a Bill of Rights is. Now what you need to know is that uh, despite having the 2016 constitution in force, when it comes to human rights issues, we use the 1996 constitution and human rights are found under part three from about articles 11 to 21. And um, the explanation is very simple. The reason why we're still referring to the 1996 constitution is because the referendum did not go through. And therefore no one can tamper with our human rights if as citizens, we don't wish to change anything to do with human rights. Now, Sorry, the yes, please. I, I, I ask on, on second generation. On? Uh, yeah, uh, I want to say to, to clarify uh, on, 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 on right, right to water. What right to water. Yeah. All right. So when we talk about the right to water, there's actually, I think, a UN General Assembly resolution, which clearly defines what the right to water is. When we talk about the right to water, it means that a person must be entitled to uh, access clean and safe drinking water and and just any other water that is needed for a person's survival. That is the right to water. So meaning, even if a country is a desert such as Botswana, a government cannot say that this country does not experience much rainfall and so on. It is the responsibility of the government to ensure that there should be a provision of safe and clean drinking water and water that is needed for other um, things pertaining to, to supporting life. So that is the right to water. But if you want more information on the right to water, it is a general assembly resolution, but I can't really remember for which year, but these are actually contained in international uh, instruments, which states from around the world actually adhere to and must come up with deliberate policies to to try and promote these rights. Because there's a, there's a certain system around the world which is used to monitor whether governments are promoting human rights or not. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, so, like, I uh, about the treaties and which countries have signed to. So, is there a, are there any penalties if countries do not uh, follow promote human rights? 
Okay, that's a very good question. Human rights law is actually under international law. And you need to appreciate the nature of international law that um, when it comes to enforcement, it may not be as easy because it deals with uh, cooperation from the member states. Simply because, for example, international law has no police force, they say, like we have Zambia police to, to try and uh, maybe maintain order. There are a number of arguments about international law, which could be true, but however, it is a very important branch of law. So there are quite a number of follow-up um, mechanisms that have been put in place. One of them is um, um, country reporting. Zambia is actually audited on a yearly basis by different organizations as to how it has uh, tried to protect human rights, of which uh, I would say quite a number of, of reports are still showing that human rights violations in the country are very, very high. Actually, we've still got a long way to go in the area of human rights. They may just make recommendations, and I think you've seen that a lot of money is being pumped, actually, into countries such as Zambia to try and promote human rights at different levels. I can just uh, give you an example of uh, different NGOs that we have, like UNICEF, uh, well, that is under UN, like UNICEF. We have quite a number of organizations which have come in to even do some, uh, I would say, some voluntary work. So that is one of the ways. Uh, they are, because really, even if they find that Zambia is violating human rights, punishment is very difficult. I think I've explained the nature of international law. But they'll just try and see how they can promote human rights. But if it reaches an extreme level, I think you've heard of sanctions. Certain countries have had to face, for example, sanctions, Zimbabwe. I would say how stubborn it is. Sanctions should not work if they are arrogant. There has to be political will by a, a country. Yes, we do have. We do have the, those situations whereby, quite all right, the international community can come in and so on, but I would say that the actual punishment, as in punishment, is not really there. But unless it reaches an extreme level, genocide and so on, then such a person is supposed to be persecuted under the, the Rome Statute that is under the International Criminal Court. So that now is a part of human rights known as international humanitarian law. So that is where a person has committed war crime, crimes. That is in worse scenarios. But um, in case, as an individual in Zambia, you have experienced a human rights violation, which has not been addressed by Zambia, you can proceed to the African Commission I think Roger Chongwe, Roger Chongwe did that. And uh, normally what they do is um, they will snap a certain uh, amount of damages which the state has to pay you as an individual for violations of human rights. But even that is supposed to be done with the support of the government itself. So I think uh, that's the response to your question. Any other questions? Are there any other questions? No question going on. All right. Um, then um, let's look at the Zambian Bill of Rights. Okay, so on um, the Zambian Bill of Rights, uh, I've already said it's from Articles 11 up to 21, somewhere there. And um, these are human rights we have life liberty security of the person and the protection of the law freedom of conscience expression assembly movement and association protection of young persons from exploitation protection for the privacy of his home and other property and from deprivation of property without compensation 
these are human rights that we have. And then, well, these rights that we have here are under the first generation rights. So in short, the only rights protected in the Zambian constitution under which you can petition the state for violations are known as civil and political rights. And these are the ones that we've looked at here. And we say that these rights are justiciable. Justiciable meaning you can enforce these rights in the courts of law. Only civil and political rights are justiciable in Zambia. These are the only rights found under part three of the constitution. The other groups of human rights, which I've talked about, second generation rights, which are economic rights, and third generation rights, which are a group rights, for example, children's rights, these have been thrown to directive principles of state policy. So these have been thrown to directive principles of state policy. What this means is that uh, under that part, you cannot take the government to task to say we do not have sufficient drugs in our hospitals. You cannot take the government to task if the economy of Zambia is doing poorly. At present, we have a number of economic challenges, but no one can go to court to challenge the government. Why? Because those rights by the MMD government in, in 1996 were thrown to part 10 of the constitution under what are known as directive principles of state policy. Now, under directive principles of state policy, the issue is that the government can only provide for those rights as far as resources permit in short these are more like uh, it's more like a disclaimer to say we'll do it as far as we can be able to to do it so it's like uh, somehow the government was avoiding responsibility and when you look at the the constitution review commission at that time which was uh, the Vunga review commission made very good recommendations to amend the bill of rights which up to now, unfortunately, has not been amended. So it, it was thrown out by the government to say economic rights should be under the directive principles of state policy. So the effect is that it is practically impossible to challenge the government on uh, these. Uh, actually, these are these important. These rights are so important, such as the right to food, the right to drugs, the right to health care, and so on. But there's nothing that we can say about it. So one of the things that was supposed to be changed in the proposed Bill of Rights, which was rejected, is that it meant to combine all the rights under one part, first generation, third generation, uh, as well as second generation. All of them were supposed to be made justiciable, but unfortunately, it did not go through. The other change is that it brought in new rights, such as the rights to gender, and it also meant to protect the rights of children because children's rights are not well protected in this country. If you read the rights which are in the constitution, which are actually here, you will not see any mention of a child being protected. Well, just relying on international legislation, which is inadequate because international law hasn't got a direct effect on our legal system. If I talk about the constitutional court as well, right now it is uh, it hands a shackled when it comes to human rights issues. Why? Because its power is subject to Article 28, which is here. But the Constitutional Court cannot handle any human rights issues currently because its powers are subject to Article 28 of the 1996 Constitution. In other countries such as South Africa and even Namibia, they have constitutional courts which are effective and operative and which are effectively protecting any human rights violation. So in short, what I'm saying is that our current view of rights is not adequate. 
it is not protecting us enough. And if I was to go on further to explain about the, the horizontal and vertical application of human rights, you need to know that when a fellow a citizen violates your human rights, you cannot take them to court presently to say, um, Miss Banda has violated my human rights. No, unless it is on the top, it has to be maybe the government which violates your human rights. All these are limitations in terms of human rights protection, which makes our bill of rights to be quite inadequate in the present world. No wonder we are experiencing a very high level of violations of human rights, which some of us almost every day, our rights are violated, but we've got nowhere to go to because our human rights system is quite weak. So the call to amend the Bill of Rights was basically meant to protect you and I. And unfortunately, it was politicized. People had mixed feelings thinking when they vote yes for the referendum, they are voting for Ed Galungo. The other challenge being of sensitization. This topic is technical, I think from the explanations that you are hearing. And let's think of our friends in Shangombo. They just bring something and say, can you vote yes or no? These are technical issues. You need time to sit with someone, explain to them so that they can appreciate human rights, such that when the exercise now comes and is brought to them, they're able to participate effectively, not just participating for the sake of participating. And we also lack resources. That's what I would say. So as a result, they had to, to combine elections together with human rights issues. Then at the end of the day, we got zero results because of lack of resources, lack of manpower, lack of knowledge, lack of so many things. So that is the challenge with the Zambian human rights system. And that is how our current human rights system is. And if you check for the latest reports on uh, Zambia uh, uh, and its observance of human rights, you will agree with me that there are so many violations, beginning with the police station. In so many places, there are so many violations. And sometimes you just let it go. Why? Because there isn't much support that you might receive in trying to, to, to speak out and say, I've got the right to do this, and so on, unfortunately. Any questions up to that point? Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Hello, good afternoon, ma'am. Yes, please. Yes, I'm wondering, you're saying uh, we are still referring to the 1996 constitution. And I can get you. You're saying we're still referring to the 1996 constitution. Is it? Yes. And what about the National Constitution Conference? Is there any bill? Uh, is there anything that we're referring to right now? The NCC is a body that was constituted to look at um, the draft constitution. Not necessarily to look, but the NCC was carrying out some deliberations to try and compile perhaps what people would like to see in the constitution. Uh, when you look at uh, the modes of adopting the constitution, you'll see that there's a constitutional conference. The NCC was actually a constitutional conference of which it has since been disbanded because it carried out its mandate. So up to now, uh, by, by now we don't need the NCC. Yeah, and then um, if we're referring to the 1996 constitution, that is only on issues of human rights. And if you got me very clearly, I said because the referendum did not go through. So meaning the, the, the Bill of Rights cannot be transported to the new constitution. Why? Because human rights are entrenched in the constitution. And no one can tamper with them unless um, the time when citizens will vote and the threshold of, uh, I think it was 50%, met, then that's when human rights will appear in the new constitution. As it stands, 
We are using Act Number Two of 2016 pertaining to other things, yes, but on human rights issues, it is 1996 Constitution, and it will remain like that until further notice. That is the position. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Are there any other questions? Any other questions on human rights? Uh, as for me, no question. Okay. Is everything okay on human rights? All right, so human rights, actually, yes, please. Um, I would like to ask, um, I've noticed there are situations in some communities whereby they've just set that sort of moral that once a thief is caught, they should deal with him or her on the spot, no need to call the police. Should we say that they are violating his, it is- They are. It they is are. wrong. It is very wrong because even if I find you killing someone, you shoot the person. I'm not supposed to say that you are guilty. I'm not supposed to, to say you should just be sentenced unless you go through the procedure. You have to go to court until the court of law proves you to be guilty. So you are innocent until proven guilty. Even if I see you stealing, the law demands that we should apply the due process until you are pronounced guilty in the court of law. So that is very wrong. Uh, all right, madam, but I've noticed that it goes unattended to the police just come and then they just go. They don't really do much. I think uh, they do carry out some arrests and so on. They, they can't just come and go. I think they do carry out some arrests and so on. Yes, but um, what I would say is that the law, theoretically speaking, is one thing and applying it in practice is another. It is the people who have to make the law work. The law cannot make itself work. All right, madam. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? So, uh, yeah, I, I have a question. Yes, what's your question? Uh, does human rights contradict with each other? The what? Like for, does human rights contradict with each other, like right to privacy, it has the right to, to something else. Okay, well, no, I don't really get what you're saying. Which rights contradicting each other? Suppose the right, right to private uh, contradicting to right to life, uh, sorry, right to, okay. to, to water. Suppose uh, someone drives his ball and then uh, doesn't I, want people to. Okay, I, I get your point. Um, right. As much as we have these rights, they're not absolute. Just because you have uh, the freedom of expression doesn't mean that you must go about insulting people and saying whatever you feel like. So I would say that these rights have limits. So if you want your rights to be respected, respect other people's rights too. And what you need to know is that within the constitution, there are what are known as derogations from fundamental rights and freedoms. What we mean by, by derogation is that in certain circumstances, the law may expressly provide that uh, perhaps do not move maybe beyond a particular time that during a state of emergency. And uh, this one is done, for example, when something is in public interest, I would say, it outweighs our individual rights. That's one thing you should know. That's why uh, sometimes when the president is passing and so on, we might have to give him a right of way. Why? Because he's holding the highest office in the land. And I would say that he's, he's holding the leadership of the country. So there's no way that they, they would respect my rights as an individual at the expense of the rights of uh, Zambians. 
as a whole. There's no right which contradicts with the other, but we need to be mindful of how we exercise them, at what time, and also are we eligible to exercise it. So there are just so many things actually attached to human rights. So it doesn't mean that just because you've got this right, then you can do anything with it. No, we need order. So how can that order be achieved? We have limitations on what you can do and what you cannot do. Any other questions? Any other questions? Hi, madam. Sorry, I would like to take you back just for a bit. Bits. I just need clarity on, um, like you're saying, yeah, we we have we all have rights and everything, but what if um a certain political party is only doing certain things, like in a bill, like a, for example, Bill Ten, Bill Ten can um uh, hinder some other political figures to participate in the in the in the elections. Does that mean it's infringing on their rights, or because the other party has got more power? I want to understand where someone can manipulate because they're in government. Thank you. Well, in terms of manipulation, yes, they may manipulate. Um, that is the nature of, of a human being. And uh, when you talk about Bill 10, to say maybe it can limit some people's rights maybe in terms of vying for presidential office and so on, just because it favors them. I think we've seen situations like that. But it is hoped that whatever law is agreed on is for the common good of everyone. So it is hoped that the people in parliament, as uh, they conduct their debates and so on, they, they do that um, with the interest of the majority of Zambians at heart, then definitely such a law will be beneficial to us all. So it is only hoped that. But the other thing that you need to be mindful of or, or maybe aware of is that discrimination cannot be eliminated completely. In certain circumstances, discrimination is inevitable. I know when you hear human rights, uh, the first thing that might come to your mind is discrimination. In certain circumstances, it is permissible. Um, one of the philosophers, uh, said it is not possible that, for example, uh, a person who sweeps outside can be treated the same way as a CEO of a company. You, you know that very well. That is not as discrimination, but it is permissible within certain uh, limits. It's not necessarily bad. Any other questions? Are there any other questions? Are there any other questions? So basically, uh, with human rights, we wrap up characteristics of democracy. So those are just some of the pointers to look at when you want to assess whether a country is a democratic state or not. And I will leave that one to you. And I'm hoping that you will actually pass on the knowledge on human rights to other people continue researching more on the subject. It is very important for us all. I think with those words, I wish to thank you so much for attending today's class. I will see you next week. Thank you, Madam. Madam, you said uh, your class is going to conduct uh, 